Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. On today's episode, I'm going to share with you some tips that I've learned over the years from being a studio portrait photographer. I'm pleased to announce the release of my Capture One and Lightroom presets, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder. These are all available for purchase at my website. Go to kevindealphotography.com or check out a link in the description below. And now, on to today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button below. So if you're watching today's episode and you are an up-and-coming studio portrait photographer, uh, this may very well be the episode for you. I'm going to tell you some things that I've learned working in the studio that have made me a better photographer. Some of them are photography related things and some of them are post-production related things. And we're gonna start with post-production related things because the number one thing I wanna talk to you about in today's episode is taking the 50,000 foot view. And what do I mean by that? When you are hired to edit a project, a lot of times you have these high megapixel cameras and you zoom in and you're at 100% and you see every small imperfection. But did you ask yourself who is going to be viewing this and how are they going to be viewing this? Because just because you have a 50 or a 100 megapixel camera that can see everything, if it's going to be viewed on Instagram from a distance, there really is no reason to zoom in and edit all that small stuff. So what I do is I zoom out, I take the 50,000 foot view, which is where I look at it the way it's supposed to be looked at, the way it's going to be viewed, and then I tend to zoom in one layer closer than that. And anything that stands out to me, I edit it, and then I zoom back out to the 50,000 foot view. And when everything looks good to me, I'm done. Now, if you're doing stuff for print, or you're doing stuff that's going to be blown up big, you're gonna have to go several layers in, or if you're doing something like beauty photography, where skin imperfections are going to be very obvious, uh, this doesn't apply to you. But if you uh, want to save a ton of time in editing, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be done. And done is not perfect half the time, depending on how you're going to view it. So if you're viewing something from a distance, you don't have to worry about what it looks like when it's zoomed in to 400%. The next thing I wanna talk about stays in the world of post-production. And if you find yourself in Photoshop trying to do something like expanding a background or editing skin, the thing you need to keep in mind is sometimes there's more than one tool to do the job. So when I expand backdrop, sometimes I use the lasso tool. Sometimes I use the uh, marquee, the rectangular marquee tool. Uh, sometimes I use the patch tool. It really depends on the situation. Uh, sometimes I find that when I'm editing skin, when I edit little white bumps on the nose, I find sometimes the spot heel tool does better than using the micro dodge and burn method with the clone stamp. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about editing things and you really have to uh, inside Photoshop, try things in different ways and then learn your situational uh, tool use of when you wanna dig in your toolbox and use a specific tool for a specific job. For all you up and coming headshot photographers who are new to headshot photography, a really cool tip I've learned over the years is if you are using a strobe, use a very bright modeling lamp in order to get those pupils small, in order to get those irises big, so you can see that beautiful eye color of your client pop in the frame. If you just use the strobe, a lot of times the uh, modeling lamp on the strobe could be pretty dark. It's going to look like they're a little bit more dead inside with the eyes. And so make sure you're hitting them uh, with a light that is bright enough to get those pupils small 
get those irises large and really make that eye color pop. Another tip I've learned over the years is when you become a portrait photographer who decides to be brave enough to use flash and then you of course become brave enough to go into the studio, people always tell you go out and get a soft box. You wanna get soft light, soft light is the answer and oftentimes it is. But I do wanna challenge you, lean into hard light. Don't be afraid of hard light. You probably started off shooting on hard light when you take a subject out at golden hour. The sun is not soft light. I love using hard light because it accentuates shape. It carves out shadows. If you're shooting an athlete and you want their physique to punch, you need to use hard light. If you are shooting beauty or something like that and you want the cheekbones to pop or you're shooting a man and you want them to have a nice prominent masculine jawline, you achieve that with hard light. Yes, soft light has its place in the world, but if you want to be a complete studio photographer, you also need to make sure your portfolio has some hard light in it as well, so you look like a more complete studio photographer. The next tip I want to share with you, and this is not just applicable to studio photography, but uh, any sort of portrait photography, but definitely in the studio, is take a step back, look at your situation. And what do I mean by that? Do they have flyer hairs? Is there an eyelash on their cheek? Do they have a cat and they have cat hair all over their black shirt? Go grab your lint roller, right? So take a step back, observe, look at what's around you. Am I gonna have to edit cat hair out of the next 20 photos because I wasn't paying attention to that? Is their eyelash, which is kind of hard to see from a distance, but very easy to see once you start zooming in, is that going to be in every shot? And I'm gonna have to take it out of every shot. Things to consider. But when you are doing uh, studio photography especially, a lot of things stand out because you're in a controlled environment, uh, you're using a high megapixel camera, it sees everything. So just stop for a second, look at your subject, make sure everything's in order, get it all taken care of. It only takes five seconds to use a lint roller on a shirt. Uh, you know, just have that model move their hairs out of the way and then fire away. It'll save you so much time in post-production. Going back to post-production, expanding your backdrop before you expand your backdrop and make it larger, the biggest thing I've learned when I'm in Photoshop and I'm cleaning up my backdrop is to clean the backdrop first. It sounds pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't think about this. Let's say you use the content aware fill to expand your backdrop out and you didn't clean it first. Well, the content aware is going to be looking at the content that exists, which is a dirty backdrop. So it's gonna analyze a dirty backdrop and it's going to expand a dirty backdrop. So now you have to clean not only the original dirty backdrop, but now you have to clean the expanded backdrop. So clean your backdrop first, then expand your backdrop. I know that sounds like common sense, but it actually took me a little bit before I realized, hey, why am I doing this the hard way? Clean your backdrop first, then expand your backdrop. Now, we're gonna stay in post-production and we're gonna stay in expanding backdrops. Obviously, that savage paper that you pay 80 or $90 for that's like eight feet wide, uh, sometimes you wanna make it look like you're in a larger studio. So to expand your backdrop in Photoshop, uh, oftentimes you find yourself needing to uh, grab your crop tool and open things up and then expand your backdrop out. Now to do that, there's a few different ways you can go about it. Now, I wanna discourage you from using the very trendy and popular generative fill inside Photoshop. And the reason why is I shoot on a 100 megapixel camera and I've noticed that when I zoom in on what generative fill fills in, there is a cap on the resolution and the parts where it does generatively fill, you will see a reduction in resolution there. So I don't want my professional work to have a reduction in resolution. So instead I use the very old classic content aware fill for the most part, and it seems to do the best job. Now, that isn't always the case. Sometimes I actually use the patch tool and sometimes I'll even just uh, transform the uh, rectangular uh, marquee tool and just expand the backdrop out that way. But I wanted to make you aware of how to do it and why to do it, and maybe uh, to avoid using generative fill because there are issues with resolution. And now to my last point, the last thing I've learned, uh, the, probably the most important thing I've learned as a studio photographer is to shoot 
tethered. There are a million reasons to shoot tethered, and I may very well do a full episode on it, but I want to touch up on the reasons why you should shoot tethered here right now. A lot of times I work with new models, and a lot of times I work with non-models. People pay me because they see my work and they say, I want to look like that. Well, they call me and they're not a model or they're a new model, so they don't really know their body that well in front of a camera. So how do you make them know their body well in front of a camera? You put them up on a big, large television screen. They can get instant feedback. They can see themselves the way my camera is seeing them a uh, half a second after I take the picture. And then they can themselves oftentimes go, oh, I need to put my hand higher. And I can also just walk up to the monitor myself and point at the places where they need to improve. And that also brings an ethical question. I see photographers all the time walk up to models put their hands on them and shape their bodies the way that they want to shape them. I personally think that's unprofessional. I know that there are photographers out there who have been doing it for 30 years. They never had a lawsuit. They never had anybody make any complaints against them. But we do live uh, in a world, and especially us here in the United States, where people sue each other for the smallest things. And you're never going to get sued for touching anybody if you never touch them, likely anyway. And I'm not giving you legal advice here, but I will tell you that if you go to a monitor and point at what people need to do, uh, you should not have to walk up to them and touch them. And I would challenge you that you learned the exposure triangle. Uh, you maybe learned your lights. You learned how to do all these things as a photographer, but all of a sudden, you decided that it's not important for you to learn how to direct a model without touching them. I personally think that that's just you being lazy. That's just another tool you can add to your tool belt. Learn how to direct a model without touching them. There's no reason why you have to touch a model and shooting tethered will help a model out and you can uh, have them be more comfortable. But more importantly, when they see themselves on that monitor, their confidence builds because they can see a professional finished version of the picture in real time. And don't underestimate how much confidence that will build in the model because after all, the point of what you're trying to do oftentimes is to translate confidence in those pictures. And if you do translate that confidence and you up the level of your shoot, now all of a sudden you maybe you've created somebody who's gonna go out and recommend you to more people. Or if you sell stuff, maybe you sell portrait sessions where they buy prints, you may sell more prints because they're gonna remember that one shot that you showed them on the monitor in real time. And so there's just a lot of reasons why you want to tether, uh, but those are the most important reasons. You can get tethering cables for 50 or 60 bucks. You can get the um, jerk stoppers. Yeah, that's what they're called. They're called jerk stoppers on the camera and on the table. So you don't destroy your laptop. So you don't destroy your camera. Uh, if you, you trip over things, you're not going to rip the motherboard out. You're not going to have the uh, laptop fall off the, the, the table. But I would say the number one thing that I have learned in photography, doing studio photography, is to shoot tethered. The benefits are so, so good. So that does it for today's episode. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching today. What are some really great studio tricks you've learned over the years that have helped you improve your photography, help you make money? Tell me about it in the comments below. Do you agree with my tips that I've given you today? Tell me about that in the comments below. And do you, if you disagree with the tips, Tell me about that in the comments below. And if you like this channel, I humbly ask you to click the subscribe button below. And uh, until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.